I said to myself in my head that, yeah, you're, you're gonna die. You're gonna die, but if you're gonna die, you're gonna take out as many of these guys as possible, and, um, and you're gonna fight so that somebody else doesn't die. I grew up in, in Philly, uh, totally, totally different from where I'm living now. Right now I'm down near the, down near the shore, uh, not too far from Atlantic City. I was a sophomore when 9-11 happened. I knew that I wasn't gonna go to college. I was thinking of different ways uh, you know, to, to better myself after high school and 9-11 and was something that was on the TV every day. So um, you know, that's when I started thinking you know, I wanted to join the service. I wasn't sure at that time what branch, but if I was gonna, Joined the service, you know, I wanted to be the, the guy that fought. So yeah, infantry was something that I wanted to do. I was very interested, uh, you know, in the Band of Brothers and all the stuff, you know, all the World War II videos and, and, and movies on Vietnam. It was inspirational. So, you know, part of me wanted to serve my country, but also, you know, be like those guys, because you know, to me, they were pretty badass. I graduated. I spent a summer uh, down, you know, down the shore here uh, in Philly, and then I wound up signing up, and I was put in the delayed entry program. So I left in March 2004 for boot camp. Basic for me was not; it wasn't too bad. I kind of kept to myself and knew I just had to fly under the radar. For our platoon, it took about like close to two years for us to ship out. February 2006 is when we deployed and we wound up flying into Kyrgyzstan. And that's when it kind of felt like it was sinking in a little bit. You're in a different country, nobody speaks your language. And then the time came when we had to get on the bird. And then that's when like, you know, you're, you're in the bird and you're flying and out of, out of nowhere it turns red. That means you're in combat zone country. So yeah, I mean, that, at that moment, when, when that light changed for me, uh, that's when it was kind of real, for real. We got off the bird. And it was just a completely different feeling than any other experience that you had. Like you get off and there's this distinctive, uh, you know, wood smell, smoke burning. Um, you know, the air just seems, you can just feel like the air a lot cooler, thinner. Um, you know, you had the mountains in the distance. We heard of where we were going. It was going to be a place called Fob Tillman in Lawara. Other guys that have been there that weren't from our unit, started talking to them, they find out that we're going to Fob Tillin and they start saying things like, hey, listen, you need to keep your head down. Like that, that place is a, a bad spot. Like, holy shit, like you know, you're going there. And you know, for a group of cherries that never been to war before, and you have a guy telling you that, it was, I mean, it was scary as shit. It was, tell you the truth, we were all scared. That first week there, you know, we all got our CIBs. It was just became routine. It was either rockets, it was either firefights, getting mortared, whether you're on the FOB, whether you're on the OPs, same thing, 95% chance of getting hit. And it was June, June 19th, uh, 2006. Our platoon was tasked with manning the OPs. So we had a squad on OP1 just outside the FOB, and then the rest of the platoon was out at OP4. Fifteen, twenty minutes into our guard shift, you know that's when it popped off. You know, a huge explosion. You knew it was an RPG immediately, and it exploded just to the right side of the west bunker. Essentially, surrounded 360 by um, multiple support by fire positions. They're hitting us with AK fire, machine gun fire, RPGs, um, and it was pretty. It was accurate. I mean, we were pinned down. My immediate uh, reaction was to get on the 240 and I just started suppressing the hilltop. Vito came over, started feeding me rounds and we were just blazing away. And they started calling in grids uh, to put on, you know, artillery rounds on, on, the, on those hilltops. I mean, it was RPGs, it was machine gun. They were just riddling all, the entire roof was just being like um, shot up to hell. Sandbag walls around us were being shot up to hell. RPGs were exploding everywhere. We can hear the artillery. So it was just a deafening 
like just assortment of, of noise. It was just, it just seemed like straight chaos. And then I started seeing tracers coming up at a vertical angle, you know, and they're hitting all around us, kicking sand, kicking gravel. RPGs are still hitting just outside the bunker, hitting the bunker. And I'm like, hey, Sergeant Matt, hit these fucking guys. They're, I mean, they're, look where they're flying, they're coming up. They're, they're down there, you know, and they're coming up. Uh, Davis is now at this point pointing his 240 down, firing at these dudes. I wound up getting my saw doing the same thing. The tracer rounds were coming in at, at such a pace and so accurate that the, the metal pickets that were supporting the roof of our bunker, just you can just hear them dinging off, dinging off. They're still coming up, you know, and they wind up, there's three different elements surrounding, the assault element started surrounding the bunker. At some point, we start hearing these guys, and they're screaming to each other. And that's when I was like, fuck. Like, you know, like, they're right there. I mean, the fact that I can hear them clear as day means they were just right on the other side of the sandbag wall where we were. They started throwing grenades at us. We started throwing grenades back. I was throwing them, Sergeant Matt was throwing them. Montgomery came over, I remember. He comes rushing in. He just was standing up straight, just popping, popping them off. I mean, we had guys throwing cots out the, out the door, you know, to block anybody from coming up. I said to myself in my head that, yeah, you're, you're gonna die. You're gonna die. But if you're gonna die, you're gonna take out as many of these guys as possible. And, um, and you're gonna fight so that somebody else doesn't die. I mean, we were just throwing everything that we had at them, and it worked. You know, the next morning, just the whole area was just scattered with casings everywhere. You can see all, all the impacts from the RPGs, the side of the hill that we were on, scattered with blood trails. That's probably the one incident out of my entire 16 months there that, you know, when I got out, I constantly thought about because uh, it's still to this day just unbelievable how no one died from that, from that assault. That happened in June 2006 and we were supposed to come home. They, they called us all in. You know, we huddled up and, and they said uh, we got extended. And we had to go back to the same exact spot. So to get that news, it was like somebody just walked up to you and just kicked you in the stomach. We came back. It was like June 2007. I got back and we started doing the out processing stuff and I wound up getting out um, in the fall of 2007. So a few months pretty much after we got back from Afghanistan. The transition was difficult at first. At that point, it was like two months ago, you were like fighting for your life, and now you're just out in the civilian world. You just feel like nobody understands, like you can't tell your stories, like you just don't feel like they get it. And it was at, you know, those few times I just said to myself, like, it's not worth talking about it. You know, that, that took time. And it, I mean, then you have to worry about the dreams you have, thinking about, you know, the different stuff that went on. Because I think it is important that people, veterans, uh, that have gone through similar situations tell their story. And when you really don't feel like you have anybody that listens to you or truly understands what you went through, it's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult to grasp and take in. So the Lionhearted Project it's great in the sense that it allows veterans to express what needs to be expressed. You know, to have all your experiences, emotions and all that bottled up inside, it doesn't help. For me to do this project and, and you know, put it out there for everyone to see, you know, I hope people, whether civilian or veterans, take it 
understand what I've been through, what other veterans have been through, and just understand that it's okay, you know, to, to tell your story. And I mean, if somebody were to ask me, I would encourage it, you know, go down to your local post or whatever the case, surround yourself with people that are gonna um, listen, be sincere, because that will help you succeed. You know, you need to get it off your chest.